sermon passage today is 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. One Peter chapter three, starting at verse one. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Husbands, In the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, thanks, Charles, and uh, good day, everyone. A uh, big welcome to you. If you're new or visiting, Ben Gray is my name. I'm the Minister of the Church, and if you're joining us online, it's lovely to have you with us too. Uh, a couple of things to let you know about before we jump into the Bible. Uh, as Joss has already mentioned, the Hub of Hope Christmas is coming up. Because of COVID, Anglicare can't pack hampers like they normally do. And uh, so what they've done instead, I think, is genius, which is that they have paired up churches to pack each other's hampers. And so for us, as a church, we're going to give out 60 hampers on the 9th of December. And St Andrews at Strathfield are praying for us and are packing our hampers for us and then they're going to deliver them to us here. So I thought it would be good for us, why don't you be praying for St Andrews Strathfield as we head towards Christmas for Kevin Kim and for Kate... Dallitz, whose married name I can't remember. Um, Anyway, she's from Anglicare directing the packing of our hampers and Kevin Kim's the senior minister at St Andrew Strathfield. Pray for them in their lead up to Christmas as well as for us as we uh, seek to share the love of Jesus with our nearest and neediest neighbours at Christmas. Uh, This morning we're in 1 Peter 3. We're thinking about marriage because that's what the Bible's uh, taken us towards. Uh, can I recommend, because this will definitely not be the final word on marriage, uh, can I recommend a, a book for you, which is called This Marriage and the Mystery of the Gospel by Ray Ortland. Uh, it's extremely helpful, it's extremely readable, and it's extremely short. Uh, so I commend that book to you, Ray Ortland, Marriage and the Mystery of the Gospel. I don't have any to give away, but in due course, I'll find some. All right. 1 Peter 3, let's pray. Our Father, in light of your word and by your spirit, please give us strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. In Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I was looking through our church wedding records this week, um, partly because the wedding register was still sitting on my desk from a a wedding two Saturdays ago. In the COVID years, with all the lockdown and chaos, we've still managed 14 weddings here at All Saints, with one more to go before the end of this year. Uh, And in the last kind of 18 months there has been considerable amount of time and tears and energy put into arranging and rearranging and negotiating and comforting men and women in preparing for marriage. And lots of those discussions that I've had with couples went to the very heart of what marriage is all about because if you can't have the best pictures and the big party 
and lots of people and the Instagrammable grazing table, then what is a wedding all about? And the Bible, I think, helps us massively on that issue. What is a wedding, and more importantly, marriage, all about? One of the reasons that love and marriage are so foundational and impactful to our lives and to our experience, pressing on and feeling pressure even in pandemics, is because the God at the centre of the universe is a God of love. And marriage is foundational because he has made it a foundational human expression of his love. And while love and marriage are foundational, marriage in this life is not ultimate. The Bible begins and ends with a marriage. As God gives away the first bride to the first groom in Genesis chapter 2, he is providentially looking forward to the ultimate wedding of Revelation 21, where the union of Christ and his people will be celebrated and enjoyed forever. And so all of the Bible is a great big love story. And so all of the Bible reaches into and shapes our thinking about marriage as foundational, but not an ultimate, but a very wonderful gift of God for our joy and for his glory. And the Bible tells us that marriage is designed to be a living and dramatic picture of his love for us in Jesus. Uh, One of my regular wedding passages that I often recommend if a couple isn't sure what they'd like me to preach at their wedding is 1 John 4. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And the reason that I go to that is because the other person-centred, sacrificial and forgiving love of God that sits at the heart of the universe is so different to even our best attempts to describe and define love. That all too often centre on me and my feelings and my preferences and this moment. And so my challenge to couples is often that we need God to define and redefine love in marriage for us. We need him to turn the right way up what our sin and our selfishness so often turns upside down. And that is a verse-by-verse and a chapter-by-chapter project that happens in the Bible as God's living and enduring Word gives new life and shapes new desires and implants new values in our heart to make us more like Jesus and to reflect God's glory more and more. And that is certainly the case when we land somewhere like 1 Peter 3, where the values and desires and goals of marriage are displayed, but where we need God to turn up the right way what our sin and selfishness and cultural baggage can often turn upside down. We're in one of those passages where we need to work hard to allow God's Word to say what it says and not what we think it says or what our culture says it says. The word submission comes through the front door of our church this morning like a Pilbara coal train with all kinds of baggage, right? With 30,000 tonnes of freight built up by misunderstanding and misuse and flat-out abuse by sinful and selfish people. And so what we're thinking about together is what God means when he says in those very short exhortations, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands, husbands, be considerate as you live with your wives. That's what we want to do. We're still, you might remember, in that part of one people where Christians are being called on to display the living hope and to display the new life that Jesus gives by his word and spirit. And so these verses must be about that. Displaying the good news 
of Jesus. And one of the helpful things for us as Bible readers is that we've seen the word submit in 1 Peter in previous passages. Submission is a posture of the heart that every Christian is called to have. That's part of following the example of the Lord Jesus, who himself submits to the will of his Father. And he does so without losing his dignity, without losing his equality as God. And the posture of submitting to government authorities, to the posture of submitting to church leaders, the posture of submitting to household masters, well, that is a posture that says, my identity as a beloved child and an inheritor in the kingdom of God is so secure and is so, so fulfilling that I'm not here to grasp for power, that I'm not here to establish my status, that I'm not here to exert control, I'm here to adapt, I'm here to fit in, I'm here to make things work with order and peace that will help everyone flourish. That's the posture of every Christian submitting in different relationships that they're called upon to be in. And it's that kind of posture that Peter now applies to Christian wives, 3 verse 1. Uh, One of the difficulties is that we have, uh, in the words in front of us, in the same way, which makes us instantly think a wife is meant to submit to her husband like a slave to a master or like a civilly respectful refugee. No, Peter is making a list. Uh, Claire Smith helpfully points out in her book that the word is probably better translated also. He's not saying that all these situations are the same and require the same kind of submission, but rather he's saying here are, some, here are completely different situations where that posture of submission is applied and called for in the Christian life. And one of those different situations, one of those particular applications, is for Christian wives to submit to their husbands. And while words like submission might be genuinely hard to unpack and to live out, especially with all the freight that they carry, we do get some pretty clear ideas in this passage as to what Peter cannot mean when he calls for Christian wives to submit to their husbands. And again, I'm very much helped by Claire Smith in her book, God's Good Design, who lists these out for us, where the fact that Peter actually addresses Christian wives directly, well, that means that submission cannot mean that a wife is to check her brain at the door. It cannot mean that she doesn't have opinions, that she doesn't have agency in her life and witness in her marriage. Peter is addressing wives directly, expecting them to be intelligent, rational, capable people whose obedience to God in this area is voluntary and willing. Submission is is something that is not imposed upon a wife by anyone but is her willing and voluntary response to the gospel that leads her to live this out in obedience to Jesus. Just like last week when Peter addressed directly household slaves, he again here in addressing wives directly is taking a demographic who in the first century were given very little prominence, maybe even less respect, and he elevates them to a place of prime example for the Christian community as influential and valued members of Jesus' family. It cannot mean checking your brain at the door. It cannot mean loving your husband more than you love Jesus. Love and obedience and faithfulness to Jesus, well, that's what's overruling all of these passages. Remember last week? Glorifying God is actually the goal. What else can it mean? It can't mean that you don't have influence or voice in your marriage because one of the chief points of these verses is for a Christian wife to profoundly influence her husband, influencing him towards Jesus by the way that she lives. 
And it cannot mean that women, and wives in particular, have a diminished status or value in the eyes of God. No, Peter calls Christian wives in verse 7, heirs with you of the gracious gift of life. In a world where women inherited nothing, Peter says of Christian women, in Jesus you inherit everything. And these women, along with men, are the beloved children of God, whose living hope means a confident and secure, a permanent and a precious inheritance in the kingdom of God. This is radically countercultural. The equality that the Bible ascribes to men and women, while still maintaining the created distinctiveness of men and women. A husband and a wife are are not simply interchangeable pieces in a marriage. They are given complementary relational roles, even as they are given complementary biological roles and physiological makeups. And notice too that what Peter says in verse 1 is that He calls on wives to submit to their own husbands. He doesn't say, and the Bible never says, that all women submit to all men. And the Bible never says, and Peter doesn't say, husbands subjugate your wives. Submission is always a voluntary and willing response that is a wife's responsibility to joyfully give in her own marriage. Submission for a wife is about taking a posture that wants to work together with her husband to fulfil all God's purposes for their marriage. The Bible also uses in other places the analogy here of a, a head and a body in talking about husbands and wives. And if that's a relevant parallel, then this is not a picture of domineering and it can't be a picture of control. It's a picture of organic and harmonious working together where the husband and wife seek to value and where a Christian wife seeks to value and honour her husband to fulfil their relationship together. Uh, Steph Judd is a a minister in Melbourne who used to be at Barney's down the road at Broadway and she wrote a couple of articles just recently about this whole area, thinking it through as not only a Bible teacher but as a Christian wife. And she talked about what this might look like for her in her marriage and an example. Uh, And her and Andy were working together, they were both ministers at Barney's And on a Sunday night, she would finish earlier and walk home through some sketchy parts of Glebe. And Andy said to her, I'm not comfortable with you walking home alone through sketchy parts of Glebe. And this is how Steph responded. I'll quote her directly. She says this, I liked that walk. It was quiet time on my own after a big day with people. My husband, however, wasn't keen for me to walk home alone. He really wanted me to catch a cab. I must admit, that really grated with me. Not his desire to care for me, but the idea that I would have to change my preferred way of getting home because of his request. I liked my independence. Of course, if I had said no, there'd be nothing that he could have done about it. Nothing in Scripture gives my husband the right to control my movements or make decisions unilaterally. But God's Word calls and invites me to welcome Andrew's love and protective care for my good and flourishing. And so I caught the cab. She goes on. It's not about who's the most natural leader. It's not about competence or strength or power or privilege. It's about stepping into a living drama of Jesus' great love for his church, the giving of his life for her good, and in doing so, directing people to the great love affair which is not just for husbands and wives but for all who would come to Jesus in faith. It's about displaying the gospel, right? Ray Ortland in that little book calls it the win-win pursuit 
It's the I'm ready to adapt and make it work kind of attitude. And it's the kind of I'm here to adapt and make it work kind of attitude that is really crucial to submission in this passage. Because here Peter is directly, has directly in view a Christian wife who is married to a non-Christian husband. And again, this is radically countercultural, because for a first century wife, she was expected to follow her husband and to take his religion. And here Peter is saying, no, no, no. The desired outcome is for the husband to follow the wife and become a Christian. To be a one who, who loves and serves the Lord Jesus along with his wife. And so for the wife who's become a Christian, it would be easy for her to feel even more alienated at home. It would be very easy for her to feel like her and her husband are now pulling in totally different directions with different values and different priorities and different desires. And I know that for some here this morning, it could feel very much like that in your marriage. And for the wife who has become a Christian, the natural response may be one of fearful distance from her husband or anxious control of her husband, even with good motives. And Peter's call is that in response to the gospel and to display the hope that you have in Jesus to your husband. Don't pull apart, but stay close. Don't allow distance to form, but support and respect and honour him. Build him up. Respond with care. The goal here in verse 1 is that the husband who has not obeyed the message of the gospel would be won to Jesus by the message of his wife's life. A life that isn't increasingly detached from him or distant from him, but is fruitfully and faithfully attached to and building up of his life. Where the Christian wife might understandably respond to her non-Christian husband with anxious evangelising, Peter says, try to respond with non-anxious living instead. That they may be won over without words by the behaviour of their wives, verse 2, when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. The heart change of a new life in Jesus and the growth in character that comes through God's Word and Spirit impacting your life that can have a lasting and eternal impact on your husband. So pursue that. Invest in that. Prioritise that. Rather than the fading and superficial things that cannot have a lasting and eternal impact on anyone. That's what he says in verses 3 and 4. Have a look there. Your beauty, he says, should not come from the outward adornment such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewellery and fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which is of great worth in God's sight. And so on the screen is a list of clothes and hairstyles that the Bible bans. No. No. Right? That's not the point. The point is the contrast between the fading and superficial beauty of the outward appearance compared to the unfading and profound beauty of the heart, the changed heart, the character of a Christian wife whose worth and position and status are rock solid and secure as a beloved child of her Heavenly Father. 
And so pursue the beauty of being changed by God's word and spirit to be more like the real Jesus rather than the beauty of being changed by the fashion industry to be more like a fake influencer. And what this looks like is a gentle and quiet spirit which doesn't rule out the extroverted verbal processing wife. Right? The gentle and quiet spirit is a picture of a wife who is so secure in Jesus that she is at peace and is a non-anxious presence for her husband, a safe haven for him. Proverbs 21 says, if your words to your husband are a constant source of criticism, a constant source of disparagement, then he would rather live on the corner of the roof. But the picture Peter gives here is that of a godly wife who is the source of refreshment and encouragement and care and support for her husband. So instead of your faith in Jesus making it feel to your unbelieving husband that you're pulling away and running away from him, instead your faith in Jesus will make it feel to him like you've come closer to him with gentleness and peace and security. And that peace that gentle presence, that peaceful influence will do wonders in displaying the living hope that you enjoy in Jesus. The comforting presence that you provide because you know the gentle and lowly heart of Jesus. The supportive encouragement that comes from knowing God's living and enduring word. Your calming influence that comes from knowing the peace that passes understanding your joyful presence that comes from having a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Which means for your husband that your home and your marriage is a refreshing refuge where he wants to be. And prayerfully, under God, if he is not yet a Christian, he might be one without a word. The Bible, thankfully, leaves the details of what this kind of submission looks like in your marriage to your marriage. The Bible doesn't give us fixed lists of who does what. It's not about who earns the most money or who does the dishes. It's not about who's smarter or physically stronger or who kills the spiders or who washes the car. The example that Peter leaves a Christian wife is that of Sarah. Sarah who stuck close to Abraham as he responded to God's call to leave home and family with faith in what God had promised. Sarah, the godly wife who made mistakes but didn't ditch Abraham when he made his mistakes who was committed to making it work and being faithfully attached at great cost, with great perseverance, with great strength of character. Why does it say? Because her hope was in God. One of the dangers and sad realities when we come to verses like these in the Bible that speak of intimate and vulnerable personal relationships, one of the dangers is that sinful people can manipulate them for their own abusive ends. And so it's important when we think about these things to point out the abhorrent reality of family and domestic violence And we need to explicitly say that to abuse, coerce or manipulate your spouse or anyone else 
is deeply sinful and thoroughly wrong and that any man who takes these verses to endorse his violence or abuse should expect the accountability of God's judgment as well as that of our justice system. And in a moment, Jocelyn's going to come and talk about that issue in a bit more detail. But what's important to see is that the Bible rules out any coercive or manipulative or abusive response of a husband towards his wife in the very next verse. As Peter turns our attention towards the loving and knowledgeable husband. Verse 7, have a look there with me. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. To be considerate is literally to live according to knowledge. As a Christian wife responds to and sticks close to and seeks to build up her husband... He ought to be one who is making that easier for her by actively seeking to know her and to care for her. As a husband who lives according to knowledge with his wife, he is concerned for her input, for her wisdom. He is a student of her heart and is seeking to help her flourish and thrive. His respect for her as the weaker partner, that is not a picture of testosterone and muscle mass. But rather, if a Christian wife willingly and joyfully and voluntarily responds to her husband with a posture of humble submission, if she is to make herself vulnerable like that, to take the position of relative weakness alongside him, well, he had better not respond with anything but caring and uplifting respect. I asked Sarah last night, I said, what do you think other husbands need to hear from this passage about living according to knowledge when it comes to their wives? And she thought that other husbands needed to hear that this means really listening to your wife. It means actively seeking to know her heart and desiring her growth in godliness. To respond to your wife in any other way will hinder your prayers. You cannot be growing closer to Jesus if you're mistreating your wife. And so my wife says to me, and other husbands, you should hear this too. This has to mean pursuing the intimacy that comes from prayer. to grow in godliness together. Because there you have a picture of a husband and a wife who have been made one flesh before God and who together desire to make it work, to stick it out, to have one mind, to have one joy, to have one bed, to have one suffering, to have one goal, to glorify God together as they partner in marriage in order that they might joyfully and dramatically put on display the faithful love of God to us in Jesus. In order that many might be one to him and one to the living hope of the Christian life. Jocelyn's going to come and speak about family and domestic violence and some helpful resources for us to be aware of. Uh, I wanted to take a moment to address the elephant in the room when it comes to passages like 1 Peter 3. 
I think it is so sad that whenever we talk about headship and submission, we have to address the topic of domestic violence because it makes it seem like the Bible is saying something that is, that is bad, that God's word is wrong and that we have to apologise for it. But the truth is that God's word is good. He wants what is good for us, not harm. He, want, he created us and he loves us. But people are sinful and God's good word has been used for evil by people who want validation for their sin. And so they twist the, the word of God to suit the evil in their hearts. And they use it to justify violence, intimidation, control, manipulation, and perversion of what should be some of the safest relationships that we are part of. On the other hand, it's good that when we come to some of these misused passages that we're given the opportunity to speak about domestic and family violence. It's a reality in our community, it's a reality in our churches, and so it's something that we need to keep bringing up and keep talking about. As a family of God's people here at All Saints, we want to be a place of safety, a place where people will be believed when they disclose abuse or violence of any kind. And a place where God's word is honoured and obeyed, not used as an excuse or a cover-up for sin. We continue to seek to promote healthy, loving, servant-hearted relationships between husbands and wives and among families. And we are thoroughly convinced that God's word helps us to do that, particularly in passages like 1 Peter 3, where husbands and wives are addressed specifically. Uh, one way that Mary mentioned when she prayed earlier that we're helping our young people to think about positive relationships is through the new Before It Starts program uh, that's been developed by Anglicare. Uh, we started it just this week at SALT by thinking about our identity what it means to be men and women, boys and girls, and uh, what the Bible says about that, and what our culture puts on us, what expectations come, come from our culture around that. The aim of this program, as we go through the next few weeks, is to help young men and women learn how to relate positively to each other, to be able to identify unhealthy patterns in relationships and to learn how to respond to those patterns. It's a proactive and preemptive measure to address the reality of domestic violence. Uh, the youth group parents have already received an email with a link to the full program, which you can download for free. Um, I'm going to send another email this week with some of the resources and the things I'm talking about now, and I'll send you a link to that program as well, so anyone can have a look at it who's interested. Um, as part of this, three of our youth leaders, including myself, have been doing and have completed the safe ministry training course called No Domestic uh, Abuse that helps people to recognise and respond to potential situations of abuse. Anyone can do that course. Uh, it's free, it's online, and I'll include the information in an email for that as well. And I, seeing 19-year-old Henry Anderson, um, sitting down with him and doing that course together, having him go home and finish it on his own because he was so keen to be knowledgeable and helpful in this area um, was one of the most encouraging parts of my week this week. Uh, our diocese also provides a number of resources that can help if you or someone you know is a victim of domestic abuse. Uh, in our toilets, we have posters that look a bit like this up uh, that have phone numbers that you can call for any man or woman who needs help. Levi, can we grab the next slide, please? Thanks. Uh, one of the numbers that's on there is the confidential domestic violence line, 1800 RESPECT. This is somewhere to call if you need information or counselling or support. On the Safe Ministry website, you'll also find um, an article on how to respond where someone discloses a DV situation, a flowchart with concrete steps to take, and a booklet on the use and misuse of scripture. Like I said, I'll provide links to all of these in my email this week. 
Another thing I'm going to include in the email uh, is something that's been rele released by Mother's Union um, in response to the UN annual international campaign called No More One in Three, which starts on the 25th of November. In that booklet, there is a Bible verse and a prayer for each day of this campaign uh, that we can be praying together as Christians in response to the reality of domestic violence and the desire to end that uh, in our community, in our country and in our world. That's a lot of different resources and there are a lot more resources out there as well. But one of the greatest resources God has given us is one another. So if you are worried about a situation that yourself or someone you know is in, uh, you can talk to someone that you trust here, uh, including Ben or myself. God has designed marriage as a picture of the relationship between Jesus and the church. This is something that he planned from the creation of humankind long before we knew who Christ was or what he would come to do. There is no perfect picture of marriage in the Bible apart from Christ and the church because there are no perfect people in the Bible. So in all things, we look to Christ. We're seeking to love and serve and imitate him in our marriage relationships and in the way we respond to sin. In Ephesians 5, we read, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. For you were once in darkness, but now you are in the light, you are in the light of the Lord. Live as children of the light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness and truth, and find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. The light of the truth of the gospel exposes the evil of domestic violence for what it is and calls us to walk instead in the way of truth and in the way of love. Ben's uh, going to pray for us now in response to this. Let's pray, friends. Our Heavenly Father, we sit humbled by your faithful and sacrificial love for us in Jesus. We long for marriages and family life that reflect your love and present to our world the hope of the gospel. Please allow our marriages to be safe havens for men and women to flourish and grow. You are the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. We pray especially today for the victims and survivors of abuse within our church, our wider churches, and in our community. Have compassion upon all who have suffered the injustice, humiliation, and pain of abuse, physical, emotional, sexual, spiritual, and all other forms of sinful conduct. In the midst of their distressing circumstances, give them courage to speak. May your perfect love drive out fear and anxiety. In your mercy, create opportunities, particular, particularly for women and children, but also for men to share their pain, reveal their struggles, and expose the hurtful actions of others. Give grace, sensitivity and wisdom to all who will minister to the victims and survivors of family and domestic abuse. Strengthen them and their carers with the certainty of your love. Gracious God, please allow our marriages to dramatically and joyfully present to our world a non-anxious and peace-promoting presence that not only builds us up in your most holy love, but also draws others towards and not away from the Lord Jesus, that you may be glorified and Jesus might be honoured in our hearts and in our homes. We humbly plead these things in the name of our Saviour Jesus Christ, who died and rose and now sits at your right hand in glory. Amen.